promised I would never do this to myself. <laughs> a Sunday morning. Most of all, an Easter Sunday morning. Here I am. You guys talk me into it. You guys all look amazing this morning. Dressing to the nines for Easter Sunday. You know, I promised my mom I wanted to be a from my script. As most of y'all know, I write out word for word exactly what I'm going to say. <laughs> but I got to be for that. <laughs> we were going to grab the ones this morning. I promised my mom that I would dress nice on Easter Sunday. As you can see, I really didn't do that. Mostly as a shout to Easter. I wore my tattered jeans because they're comfortable. And I dressed up real nice for y'all. But since we do this every Sunday, there's really no need for me to dress out of what I normally would to help me take that off. Because Easter is just reminiscent of that which we do every Sunday. We remember the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ every single Sunday. We don't need a day out of the year to do it. So, there's me deviating from my script. Now let me jump right back to into this. If you would, turn with me to 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. And it reads, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Being young, you all know how much I love my life, but invariably, I'm not going to live forever. None of us are. I have come to a revelation, and I've accepted that one of these days, I, well, at least my physical body will die. <clears throat> and I've grown to relish in that fact. And one day, I will be with my Lord and God. Like Paul also said, to live is Christ, but to die, to die is to gain. <clears throat> So now I don't look upon death with fear, but rather with anticipation. Now, don't misinterpret that statement. I don't want to die. I don't want to die anytime soon. I do everything that I can to neglect that and elongate my life as long as I can. <clears throat> but the amazing thing is that when we die, we will gain everything. This life is merely a preparation for the eternal life that one day we will live. It won't be the same physical life that we know and love now, but we'll get to that in a little bit. <clears throat> in preparation for the sermon, I became, I was rather nostalgic of those in my past, the events and the people that I've known. <clears throat> and I couldn't help but think, wouldn't it be amazing if we could just stop time Stop time and enjoy the moments that we've been in. Enjoy the people that we're with. But for that wish, that's just a wish in futility. We have no power to stop time. We have no power to delay time. And when it comes to God's word, we, we can't do anything. God, God's will will come no matter what we want. <clears throat> but the chief priests and Pharisees, they learned this lesson the very hard way. After they crucified in Christ, they came to Pilate, and Matthew writes in Matthew 27, 63 to 66. Turn to be there really quick. Matthew said after three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. And say to the people, He has risen from the dead, 
so the last deception will be worse than the first. When Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way and make it secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, secure securing the stone, sealing the stone, and setting the guard. Now, I don't know if y'all see this, but... <coughs> I see some pretty good humor out of this story. <clears throat> and I can only imagine that God saw great humor in this story. <clears throat> can you just imagine, just for a moment, God looking down in this verse, the chief priests and Pharisees going to Pilate over the man that they just killed, saying that his disciples are going to steal his body. So they put a stone in front of the tomb. A mere stone. I can just imagine the Roman guards struggling and grunting to push the stones up twice, three times their size in front of a tomb just to keep the um, disciples out. <clears throat> and then putting the seal of the Roman Empire on it and finally standing guard for three days and three nights to make sure the disciples don't steal his body. Can you really imagine that stopping God? Can you imagine God who created the heavens and the earth being thwarted by a mere stone, which he created as well? And can you imagine God who created mankind in and of itself being stopped by one of his own creations merely wielding a sword and spear? <clears throat> In Matthew 28, 2-4 reads, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him, and became like dead men. <clears throat> now this is just amazing. It just adds more to the humor. He sent down an angel to move the stone, and he just sat on the stone, scaring the um, guards. They became like dead men in the presence of God. They had no power over Christ rising. They couldn't do anything. Their actions were null and void. <clears throat> You see, the chief priests and the Pharisees were trying to stop the inevitable. They were trying to steal the Son of God, or make sure he wasn't stolen. <clears throat> but there was no chance they'd ever succeed in that. Once God's will was set, it was set in stone. Right. But sometimes that's even what we do today. We try to take up Jesus. We try to put him in a little corner of our life and say, Lord, you're welcome to stay, but please, don't change the way that I think. Don't change the way that I act or the way that I speak. Just stay over in your little corner, and we'll get along just fine. Given that this is an Easter sermon, we'll get along just fine if we just come one time a year. We'll get along just fine if we just show up on the Sundays or the Wednesdays whenever we're allowed to come in. But we can't forget that this life is merely a preparation for the eternity that we are soon to face. An eternity in which we will either be amongst the saved or we'll be amongst the lost, depending on how we live it. <clears throat> now, the message of Easter, the conventional message of Easter, should I say, is, is that a soldiers and seals and stones can never stop the plan of God. God marches on. This plan will be accomplished. We believe this because the tomb was found empty, empty and because Jesus Christ was risen. Now, I personally wasn't there. If I was, I'd be a little bit older. Just a few thousand years, not too much. But <clears throat> I didn't see what happened. But I believe in the resurrection with all my heart. <clears throat> I also wasn't there when the Germans surrendered in World War II. But I do believe that we won, and I have two very good reasons for that. First off, through the years I've heard 
testimonies I've read in history books of those that were there, and I have read their accounts. They seem rather believable. <clears throat> they fought battles, they saw the victory achieved, and they passed the good news on. So I believe in them. Secondly, I believe, because I realized that if we had not won that war, our world would be vastly different today. We would not be a free country. Rather, we'd be an oppressed people. Our society would be immensely different. And like I said, I wasn't there when Jesus rose. But I believe that because of those two reasons as well. I believe because the eyewitnesses say that it was true. <clears throat> and in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, Paul writes, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, and then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five thousand brethren all at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some has fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, and then by the apostles. Then last of all he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. <clears throat> And then if you would, in 1 John 1, 1 and 2, it reads, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen, and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. In other words, John here is saying, I want to tell you what we saw. I want to tell you what we felt, and I want to tell you what we've experienced. I want to tell you about Jesus. <clears throat> and then the second reason, which we've already gone over, but maybe more important than even what is written here in front of us, I believe that because our world is greatly different because Jesus arose. If Jesus wouldn't arose, I was watching a movie the other day. I don't remember exactly what it's called, so don't quote me if I don't quote it right. But there was a, um, they're arguing about creationism against evolution. And it came down to why do we believe that God exists and why Charles Darwin was wrong? Why evolution couldn't even be a conceivable factor? <clears throat> And it was because most men, if we had the choice, we wouldn't choose to have God in our lives because every part of Christianity goes against the humanity that he created for us. That's why the Israelites had so much trouble in their day-to-day -day lives. There were 600 laws that they had to follow, and they obviously failed. That's why we had Jesus come to die, to be buried, and to be resurrected for us. So that way we would have the free will to, to choose the life that we live, to choose to be Christians, to be Christ-like, to follow Him. <clears throat> and also in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ had not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. You realize that if Jesus didn't rise, there would be no reason for us to be here on Sunday. If he didn't rise, there would be no reason for the amazing institutes that there are to teach Christian faith like Free Hardman. There would be none of that. Most of us wouldn't know each other if Christ hadn't risen. We wouldn't run into each other on the streets. We come here all the time. We become brothers and sisters because Christ rose. <clears throat> but since he rose, it also changes the way we look at life. And uh, when 
when God talks about death in the scripture, he uses different words than we use. Jesus talked about death as sitting down to a banquet with God. God has invited us to his own banquet, but beforehand we have to prepare for the feast. We can't come empty-handed. Most dinner guests come with either a side dish or a drink or something. We have to come with a life worthy to be come to the banquet. <clears throat> and it will be a time of joy and happiness and of fellowship. <clears throat> Jesus also says that death is like going home. I don't know about you guys, but at the end of my day, that is the best phrase I can hear. I get to go. I don't have to be at work anymore. So in writing this, it's this life is work. At the end of our day, whenever it comes, we get to go home. Yeah. It would be wonderful to go to home in heaven and be able to relax in fellowship with those that have gone on before us and those that will go on after us. And to feel the love and the warmth of Christian life. <clears throat> also, death is like a graduation. I was talking with one of my friends, actually my boss, the one who I was bringing up in most of my sermons. <clears throat> he was telling me how he remembered his graduation day quite thoroughly. <clears throat> he went up to receive his diploma. He remembers walking the stage. <clears throat> it's a brisk May afternoon. He remembered walking on the stage and receiving his diploma. Only when he walked off the stage, he kept thinking, this really represents a lot of accomplishments. This one piece of paper can represent every test I've ever taken, every essay I've ever written, every cram session I've ever been to. It's all on one piece of paper that says, you've finally done it. You've graduated. You can live the life that you should be living. <clears throat> Here is a study all represented in one piece of paper. Now, we get one of those too. Except ours isn't all that big. It's usually about the size of a bookmark. I carry this around with me pretty much everywhere I go. It's my grandfather's obituary. If we don't, at the end of our lives, we get a piece of paper that says, this is what we've done, this is what we did with our life. It's just a synopsis of our life and what we did. <clears throat> but he looked at his phone and just kept looking at it. And there was his name. He'd finally done it. Then he looked to the person next to him and he said, we did it. Let me see what your diploma says. What did you do with the years that you spent in college? <coughs> he opened the folder, and it was empty. He asked, where's your diploma? And the person next to him said, I'm not really graduating today. I'm merely going through the exercises. I, did, <clears throat> I didn't hand in all my papers or take all my tests. The school is allotting me a few extra weeks finish my papers and to turn in all my tests. <clears throat> but today, today I didn't graduate. I'll walk with you, but I'll get my diploma in a few weeks after I finish. And my friend thought to himself, but we've studied together. We've spent numerous hours together. And one graduates and the other doesn't merely based on the choices that they make. <clears throat> As I was thinking of this message, I really wanted to paint a beautiful picture for you guys of Easter. And it's an empty tomb and a beautiful spring day. I wanted to lift up Christ and say, this is what it's all about. I am fearful that on Easter Sunday I might paint a picture of false hope. 
and because the message of his resurrection is so wonderful, I might cause you to think everything is all right. But it isn't. Not for everyone. <clears throat> you see, some graduate in life and some don't. Some homes are peaceful, some are quite the opposite. Some banquets are occasions of joy, some are not. In the same way, while the cross is a blessing for those who come and accept its sacrifice, the cross also doubles as a curse for those who turn away and never acknowledge what is there. The empty tomb is the greatest source of joy for those who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But it's also the greatest source of judgment and condemnation for those who don't. <clears throat> See, you can't stop God. Not with stones and in front of tombs or seals or soldiers. You can't stop what God is doing in our life, in our world, because God will conquer. God will be victorious, and you'll either be on his winning side or you won't. Break my promise again. I was sitting in Bill's class this morning. While he was talking about <laughs> Paul. Paul, on his way to, his ma to Damascus, got blinded by the light. <clears throat> it reminded me of us coming here every Sunday. We get blinded by the light of the Word every Sunday. We see it. Sometimes we go back into our lives, we fall into the routine of our day to day. <coughs> but it took Paul. Paul went from killing those who. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm really bad at articulating why. <laughs> he went from killing and persecuting those who, who believed in Christ, the risen Savior, to he turned to them. He turned to joining them and preaching for them. I don't know exactly where I was going with that, but <laughs> it just reminded me with the Easter sermon how we, like Paul, can go from living in the world to being against the world in just the instance of being baptized. That is all that I had prepared for y'all this morning. We would please rise for the occasion song. From the 710.